Thank you. Could I ask all those members who are leaving the chamber to do so quickly and quietly? And the final item of business is a member's business debate on motion 7482 in the name of Jenny Minto on 100 years of the BBC in Scotland. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. And I would ask those members who would wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons. And I call on Jenny Minto to open the debate around seven minutes, please, Ms Minto. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I would like to start by thanking all my colleagues who supported the motion celebrating BBC Scotland's 100th anniversary of public service broadcasting. 30 years ago, almost to the day I joined BBC Scotland, and in the 18 years I worked there, I had the privilege to work with so many talented people, both in front of and behind the camera or microphone. As an accountant, I couldn't believe my luck. Here I was supporting some of the most creative and talented people in Scotland, helping them portray the stories, the people, the great times and the bad times of our country. The big events, whether they be cultural, political or tragic. The personal triumphs, the personal losses, the everyday life. In Gaelic, in English, for children, for older folk, for everyone. I thought I would share some of my, my memories of being at BBC Scotland, which I believe show the value of public service broadcasting in Scotland and the con contribution that it has made and continues to make to the Scottish creative sector. The BBC Scottish Symphony Orchestra toured China in 2008 with Nicola Benedetti. I had the privilege of being part of the management team which actually included uh, ironing Nicola Benedetti's dress at one point. <laughs> the second concert was in Shanghai. Our flight was delayed from Beijing. The stage was smaller than expected and mobile phones went off during the entire performance. The orchestra took it all in their stride and performed faultlessly. And as an encore, encore they played Purple Bamboo, a Chinese folk tune followed by a suite of Scottish reels and jigs. The audience were on their feet cheering, clapping and smiling. So we had 90 people showcasing Scottish talent across the world. The creation of BBC Alaba, preserving and encouraging the Gaelic language is one of the cherries on the top of BBC Scotland's cake. A channel with a tiny budget creating drama, comedy, current affairs, factual, children's output and a daily news programme. This is exactly what public service broadcasting is about. A partnership between BBC Scotland and MG Alba, funded by the Scottish Government and the licence fee. Pro programming made by BBC Scotland's Gaelic Department and Independence. It's a true collaboration. Grusucker, Crowdy and Cream, was dramatised by the Gaelic Department in 2002, and I spent one week uh, on a very sunny Harris when it was being filmed. And to see the true life story of Finlay J. Macdonald as he grew up on Harris in the 1930s until he left the island after the Second World War, come alive was a joy. Described by the Herald as one of the most stunning, imaginative and culturally significant experiences of the year. This was BBC Scotland at its best. And BBC Scotland also holds the most amazing archive of recordings, both radio and television. And these are living archives and are constantly being added to and footage being used in other output. The 25th of January 2009 marked 250 years since Scotland's national bard, Rabbi Burns, was born. Radio Scotland, along with the online department, created a website which celebrates his life's work in poetry and song. 66 of Scotland's biggest names recorded 716 of his work. And I return to this archive regularly, especially when preparing for Burns suppers. It, to me, illustrates the importance of archive, high production values, and the wealth of Scottish culture that BBC Scotland curates. It's also important that as we celebrate the centenary of BBC Scotland, that we recognise the role it plays economically as well as culturally. The BBC's gross operating expenditure on TV production in Scotland in 2019 represented 74.8% of all public sector broadcasting in Scotland on television. And for every £1 of direct econ economic output generated by the BBC, £2.63 was generated in the economy as a whole. You see, I can't leave my accountancy background. <laughs> There are 1,200 BBC staff in Scotland across 14 centres, Lerwick to Dumfries, Stornoway to Selkirk, and BBC Scotland works with around 60 independent production companies across TV, radio and online. 
And then there's also partnership working with organisations such as Screen Scotland, Creative Scotland, the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland and Salma Rostig. And these support apprentices learning the skills across production alongside on-screen or on-air talent. Now, launching four years ago, the BBC Scotland channel has quickly become the highest reached digital channel in Scotland. It is focused exclusively on Scottish programming, with at least 90% of its output being Scottish in origin. And I thought I'd take a quick look at tonight's schedule. So it starts with Getting Hitched Asian Style, which follows Saffron events as they organise an East Meets West wedding. Then there's the Nine, covering national and international headlines from a Scottish perspective. And Scotland's greatest escape, finding the best adventure holiday in Scotland. And then it closes with um, Scotland's best love treasure, Rabsi Nisbet. I think this illustrates how the new channel is ensuring that BBC Scotland continues to educate, entertain and inform. But there are also challenges and these are very real. The BBC has been required to take on more obligations with less income, increasing, increasing competition for audiences and the challenges of high inflation. And the BBC continues to face the challenge of getting the balance right. There is a fine line down the centre of what is political balance and this line does not lie on the same longitude in London as it does in Scotland. The programme, 100 Years of Scottish Broadcasting, concluded by suggesting that this new channel gives Scotland new hope and allows the exploration of Scotland beyond the central belt and reflect the issues facing our changing nation. Presiding officer to finish. An element of um, the first programme of David Attenborough's Wild Isles was recorded on Isla. I always get Argyll and Butin. The dramatic, if emotional, footage of white-tailed eagle grabbing a barnacle goose was filmed by an award-winning Argyll and Butte-based wildlife cameraman, John Aitchison. Though not a BBC Scotland production, it is this level of skill and creativity that emphasises the need for strong public service broadcasting. So I wish BBC Scotland a successful start to its second century and in a changing world ensure that it puts Scotland, its people, their stories at the centre of its output. Thank you, Ms Minto. I now call uh, Stephen Kerr to be followed by Sarah Boyk. Mr Kerr, around four minutes, please. Presiding officer, the, I congratulate Jenny Minto on her speech and on the motion. The BBC is indeed a precious... British institution which sets itself high standards. It most often uh, meets those standards, but it doesn't always, and that's to be expected, for, because for one reason, the output of the BBC is so broad and varied, including the description that was given of the output of BBC Scotland. The BBC is a gift that we actually share with the whole world, and the brand is sound, it stands for something. All over the world, people listen and watch BBC broadcasts, including those originating, as has been mentioned, in Scotland. They, people put a tremendous trust in what the BBC say. They listen to podcasts, BBC productions on global streaming platforms like Netflix and Prime. The BBC is a British institution. It's also a global institution. And it's promoting our Britishness, our Scottishness. And not in an in-your-face sort of a way, but in a reassuring, steadiness sort of a way. And the BBC provides a window for us on the world, and it also provides a window for the rest of the world on Britain, with all of our diversity and richness of tradition. Those images of Scotland as our late Queen was brought from Balmoral to Holyrood last September, broadcast all over the world. And they told their own story of Scotland's beauty, her people's generosity, and Queen Elizabeth's love of Scotland. I absolutely believe in the concept of public sector broadcasting. I believe the BBC has played, does play, and will continue to play a central role in the life of our nation, but I do regularly question its leadership and their priorities. I can't believe the BBC bosses really think it's a bright idea to abolish the BBC singers, all to save one and a half million pounds. I'd say, come on, BBC, it's not good enough. And all that fuss about Gary Lineker's tweets, who cares about what Gary Lineker thinks? He's paid rather handsomely, 15 times roughly the the salary of the Cabinet Secretary. He's paid all that money to talk about football on the telly. That's it. Now, about the business model, I understand it can be tempting for those in the BBC hierarchy to resist change. If it ain't broke, why fix it, as the saying goes? But this is complacent thinking. As the world and society changes, 
The BBC must change with it. Yes, it can be guided by the past, but we shouldn't be entrenched by the past. The idea of a tax on TV viewing seems to me to be something that doesn't belong quite in the 21st century. I don't believe it's going to endure. So alternative funding models need to be explored. And I'm open to consideration of all the alternatives and to all the flexibilities that could come with those changes, including the BBC leveraging its global brand to secure its income and preeminence. But the BBC must be bold in embracing not only the future, but the present. And so to my main item, Deputy Presiding Officer, the big ticket, as it were, I really don't feel that BBC Scotland, as a public service broadcaster, is giving adequate coverage to the proceedings of this Parliament. I've said this before, and I'm going to say it again, because I genuinely believe it. BBC, the BBC Scotland channel, why doesn't it broadcast the proceedings of this ch uh, chamber live and un 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 uninterrupted? You shouldn't have to navigate the internet to find the live broadcast of Scotland's Parliament. You should be able to switch on your telly. BBC Scotland is broadcasting, this is BBC Scotland, between midnight and 7pm. Why can't they take the live feed from this Parliament and distribute it as a public service? And in doing so, let people, more people, engage with their Parliament, making it easier for people to tune in. This, I believe, is the responsibility of a national broadcaster, of a public service broadcaster, and I don't understand why it doesn't happen. So, over its 100 years in Scotland, the BBC has shown it can and it does produce high-quality programmes for TV, radio, broad, uh, podcasts. I want the BBC to prosper. I want its influence across the planet to be enhanced in the next 100 years, to promote the values of decency, democracy and individual liberty, and to have nation truly speak peace and nation. Thank you, Mr Kerr. I now call Sarah Boyack, who will be followed by James Dornan. Ms Boyack, around four minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First of all, I do want to thank Jenny Minto for her uh, speech today, but also for securing us this debate. It's fantastic. And the fact that the BBC Scotland is, BBC in Scotland is 100 years old is definitely worth celebrating. Um, because it's one of our most important institutions, it is part of who we are, it's kept us informed, entertained and it's kept so many cultural artists and workers in employment over the years. I also think it's really important to us as a democracy. Over the years I have had occasional criticisms of its coverage of politics in here. But to be honest, that would be expected. I, su I suspect if we went around the whole chamber, we would all be able to cite something where we didn't like the coverage. But to be honest, it's important that our news is impartial. It has to meet high standards. And I think we should also be celebrating the BBC journalists we have who bring us that news. And reflect on those who are living in challenging places across the world who provide us with brave, accurate coverage that we otherwise would not see. And when there's conflict or humanitarian disaster, BBC journalists don't just give us news, they give a voice to those who've been impacted. And I think I also want to reflect that the, the BBC provides news to other countries across the world and in different languages. And again, the principle of impartiality is central. And I'm personally very proud that we as licensed payers do contribute to the work of the World Service. But the BBC faces challenges. Um, and there has rightly been huge coverage in the last few weeks about the need to ensure political fairness and impartiality, not just in coverage, but in management of the BBC. But I want to highlight the need that we need to make sure we don't just assume the BBC is just always going to be there. We need to make sure that there is adequate funding right across the nations and regions across all the precious cultural choices we all want to access and to ensure that the BBC is fit for purpose in a massively changing world. And if you think back during the pandemic, it kept us informed, entertained. It kept so many people who were isolated, particularly our older population, kept them connected. And we must never forget that. And I do take the point that um, has been made by Stephen Kerr. There are clearly challenges. Um, and that point about taking the decision to close BBC Singers the loss of 20 full-time equivalent musicians and administrators' jobs. And in our SEAC committee last month, we had an evidence session where concerns were raised about the rescheduling of classical, jazz and traditional Scottish music, the impact of the Digital First Agenda, how we need to continue to support young and emerging talents and the vital role of BBC Scotland in delivering that. So as we celebrate the 100th anniversary of the BBC in Scotland, 
I think it's vital that we need to ensure that the investment that's needed is provided and to keep that pipeline of investment going forward so that the BBC in Scotland can continue to create and commission the fantastic range of programmes that are so important to us. One area where we need to see that investment is support for Gaelic broadcasting, and I was really glad that Jenny Minto mentioned that in her speech. It's a national asset, Gaelic, but we need to see increased funding to continue the programmes needed and to enable Gaelic to secure its place in the digital world. And with the funding for Gaelic media almost static since the inception of BBC Alba in 2008, it's clear that it is being held back from delivering for its audiences and wider communities. And we know from research that every pound spent on MG Alba generates a £1.34 return and supports 160 jobs in the Western Isles and Sky. These are really important jobs. And we are in a world of change, and we need to be able to ensure that everybody continues to be able to access the BBC, whatever their generation, whether it's on TV, radio, or through BB Sounds or iPlayer. And that means we need continued investment going forward. So I do think it's worrying that the licence fee is potentially going. It costs £159 and it's 43p a day. That is incredible value. It supports jobs across Scotland. But the National Audit Office has warned that the BBC could be forced to replace the high-end drama and natural history programmes, just as Jenny Minto suggested, if we see UK government imposing funded cuts. And in Edinburgh, the BBC is absolutely key in supporting our international festival, our book festival and the Fringe. And it keeps Scotland on the world stage. That is something worth defending. That's something worth proud of. And if anyone hasn't seen it yet, just take a look at the programme, The Women Who Changed Modern Scotland. It's on BBC iPlayer. It's fantastic. It needs the money. Let's work together to support the BBC going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Boyack. I now call James Dornan, who's joining us remotely, to be followed by Jackson Carlo. Around four minutes, please, Mr. Dornan. an insight to Scotland too. I'm easily the oldest speaker in this debate, and so therefore I reckon that I've seen more BBC programmes than anybody else that will be speaking. Uh, I was brought up in the BBC. I've, every important news item in almost all my children's programmes came from that source. From Andy Pandy to Muffin the Mule to adventure programmes such as Robin Hood, William Tell and Ivanhoe, and I can still remember the names of the stars to this day. Richard Green, Conrad Phillips, and Roger Moore, in case you're wondering whatever happened to him again. Classic programmes such as This Man Craig, Para Handy, Auf Wheeler's End Pet, House of Cards, and I, Claudius, to more recent fantastic project productions such as Killing Eve, Happy Valley, Luther, Luther and Peaky Blinders, and of course all the great period dramas that we were so rightly fated for. I haven't even mentioned the wonderful nature programmes and documentaries they've done and continue to do, particularly with the incomparable David. David Attenborough, and I would hate to forget to mention the hugely entertaining and informative Magnificent Five Robertson from back in the day. Look it up on Google. But I think my most abiding memory of the BBC as I grew up is as a conduit for world events, firstly through our big radio, then television, and even later colour TV. My first memory of this is Yuri Gagarin becoming the first man in space, the family sitting around the, the radio at that time, it would have been. Uh, and then after that, you know, every rocket launch, we would sit by the outlet, be it radio or TV, and watch with awe as we are literally shot to the stars. The death of Pope John XXIII was a massive blow for Catholic families in Scotland, as was the death of JFK shortly after. And all of this news was brought to us by the BBC. But for me, the strength of the BBC as it grew older was in its investigative reporting. Panorama, which time after time uncovered secrets those in power wished to hide. Strong plays with social issues at their forefront were a feature, social issues being addressed through the medium of entertainment for the first time. It was priceless, and I will never forget the grounding the Beeb and my mum, who used to listen and watch these programmes alongside me 
chuntering all the time, giving me your political views, and that happened here in Scotland. That's why it's with a great deal of genuine sorrow that I have to comment on just how far I feel the beep has fallen. From the downgrading of socially contentious plays or shows to news output that at the most generous, you can only accuse of falling over their feet not to be seen to upset the hierarchy of the day. Now, that didn't just start under the Johnson government, continued through to today. It's been a long-standing practice to put pressure on the be Still thought of as a neutral reporter by many, as Stephen Kerr quite rightly uh, mentioned earlier on. But the appearance of collusion has never been so clear as it is now. The relationship between the Tory party today and the senior hierarchy is both insidious and politically and socially incestuous. Same schools, universities, clubs and often political parties. There are many of us in Scotland that have not trusted the news output since the referendum in 24, when many in the Beeb, including, I believe, some in BBC Scotland, admitted to a duty to protect the union. When that happens, you go from being a news outlet to a propaganda unit. And I truly long for the day when we can all trust the BBC news output as we have in the past. But I don't see how that can happen until the links between itself and the party of government, whoever they are, are broken and seem to be broken. In the meantime, I'll do what I've done, been doing for some time. I'll keep watching the still admirable drama and sport output, the occasional documentary programme and comedy, whilst taking the news with a pinch of salt until I can get it verified from another source. It's not something I take any pleasure in, but I'd be a fool not to. Anyway, happy 100th birthday, BBC Scotland, and thank you. Thank you, Mr Dornan. And I now call Jackson Carlaw to be followed by Beatrice Wishart. Around four minutes, please, Mr Carlaw. Thank Carlyle. you, uh, Presiding Officer, and I, I hope to speak completely spontaneously. Can I begin by congratulating Jenny Minto on her motion and on the words of congratulation that she's expressed to the BBC? Uh, November 1963 was, of course, uh, an, a month of international world significance. It was when the first episode of Doctor Who was broadcast. And this four-year-old was, at that time, completely entranced, along with the, uh, to compete with Mr Don and the wooden tops and uh, Blue Peter. Uh, I was thereafter absolutely smitten with the BBC, furious the following week, by the way, when Kennedy's assassination meant that the first episode of Doctor Who was repeated rather than us getting to see the next one, which featured the Daleks, which, of course, determined my childhood thereafter. <laughs> um, and I became, at that point, uh, embraced a ritual I have never broken. Every Tuesday since 1963, I have read the Radio Times when it has been published. And even this week, I bought it uh, just yesterday, it remains an almanac of everything that the BBC does. It's complete range of television, radio, the World Service, uh, the uh, local radio stations. Uh, it is an almanac of everything that the BBC does. And it has been the cultural tapestry of my life. But, but we have to recognise that that world has changed. When this parliament uh, met in 2016 and had the BBC in to discuss how many hours of programming were going to be filmed in Scotland, we didn't realise that the world was changing underneath our feet with the introduction of streaming. And if you look at this week's Radio Times, the 10 pages that used to be devoted to film reviews have now been axed in favour of 10 pages covering streaming services, Apple, Disney, Now, BritBox, Paramount, Netflix, Amazon Prime. And people under the age of 35, it's not about the principle of the licence fee. I support the principle of the licence fee. The fact of the matter is, an increasing number of people under 35 aren't paying it. They aren't subscribing any longer. They are happy to watch streaming services instead. And therefore, I think as a funding model going forward, the licence fee is not something we can rely on over the next 10, 20 years as a reliable source of income to fund the BBC. And if, as we expect, terrestrial traditional broadcasting services are to be switched off and all broadcasting will become online, then what is the model? And I would venture that with its brand recognition, the BBC could become one of the world's most successful international yeah, streaming yeah. services to compete with every one of the ones I mentioned a moment ago. But it doesn't mean that there hasn't still got to be a role for public service broadcasting in that. And I think we need to have an intelligent conversation about how that will in due course be funded. Because we do want to see Gaelic 
television promoted. But if that was to be supported by a streaming service, frankly, there wouldn't be enough people watching to generate the income to fund a television channel. We do want to know that there will be news reporting, that the World Service will still have a role, it having received government funding uh, to support it. But I think we have to ask ourselves, in an environment where the licence fee will increasingly be irrelevant to younger people, and that younger cohort is only going to grow, who now watch streaming services and get their media in different ways, simply to believe that the BBC can survive on a licence fee model alone, I think is foolish. And you look at the ratings. When I talked about those programmes I enjoyed, some 20 million people yeah. watch the BBC every week. Yeah. I look still at the TV ratings. I'm an anorak for these things. You're at the top of the top 10 now, sometimes with as few as 3.5 million viewers on terrestrial television. People are getting their entertainment in different ways. Gone are the days when you sit down simply to watch the schedule that any one broadcaster has laid out for the night. Gone are the days when you wait one week to the next to see what, you'll, what will happen. You want to see the box sets and binge on some shows while stretching others out. So I congratulate the BBC. I'm a fan of the BBC. I want the BBC to have a future. But I think we need to take some of the pejorative partisan argument out of all of this and sit down and discuss rationally how do we ensure that the BBC is protected as an institution that can provide public service broadcasting on a sustainable funding model into the future, which may be a mix of licence, but it will have to be something else beyond that too if we're going to see it prosper and survive. Thank you, Mr Carlow. I now call Beatrice Wishart to be followed by Sharon Dowie. Around four minutes, please, Mr Wishart. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I join others and thank Jenny Minto for bringing this important debate to the Chamber to celebrate and congratulate BBC Scotland on its first century of broadcasting and how things have changed, as Jackson Carla has been alluding to, since BBC Scotland's first live radio transmission from Glasgow 100 years ago. No longer do people have to tune in at a fixed time to hear the news or watch their favourite programme. We're able to watch or listen at a time of our choosing. Members won't be surprised that I want to focus on the importance of BBC Scotland in the Northern Isles, particularly on our highly valued local radio stations, but more of BBC Radio Orkney and Radio Shetland later. I'd like to reflect a little on the 30-year post-Second World War period from the perspective of my late father. His war service included time in the Far East as an army film cameraman, and he came home after the war to run the family-owned local newspaper. Along with his business partner, who was also the paper's news editor, the pair were approached by the BBC in Glasgow at a time when its news service in Scotland was being developed through freelancers, and the BBC wanted news from Shetland. So they were to provide a different kind of reporting for the BBC from the written word that they were used to, and sent telephone voice reports. They also had a link with BBC Aberdeen for the Town and Country magazine programme, which was aimed at audiences in Caithness, Orkney and Shetland. The arrival of television meant a new form of local journal journalism, so they were provided with a 16mm camera, changing and adapting as technology developed. All in all, they reckoned they sent around 1,000 contributions. Shetland was the last area in Britain to get television when the transmitter on Bressa was finally turned on in 1964, apparently coinciding with Grant National Day. A news crew from the Tonight programme was sent up from London. The powers that be clearly thought it was too important an historic moment to leave the coverage to the local stringers. My father delighted in telling the tale of how the small ferry boat, laden with the London TV crew and an enormous amount of equipment, crossed Lerwick Harbour to Bressa. The team headed up the hill to the transmitter for the big switch on, only to discover that they'd left the camera behind. Turning now to our local BBC radio stations, which began 46 years ago. Each weekday, Radio Orkney in the morning and Radio Shetland in the evening, there's a half an hour programme broadcasting a mixture of local news and current affairs, updates on local events, and for the farming and fishing communities our islands are involved with, the all important weather forecast. A space on air then for our island news, events, and shared culture. And our stations are well respected for their impartial coverage. Whether it's the livestock sales at the Orkney Mart or fish landings at Lerwick, 
breaking news like the scientific breakthrough and linked to breast cancer in Orkney last week, or major events, it will be on the radio. Events like the inter-county games between Orkney and Shetland, an annual event with each island taking turns to host and compete for sporting trophies. The teams at Radio Orkney and Radio Shetland do similarly in terms of reporting the action while honing their sports reporting skills. Local radio is a lifeline, especially during power cuts or in extreme weather events, which might see ferries and flights cancelled or close the Churchill barriers. At the end of last year, Shetland was hit by both the telecoms and power cuts, and those radio bulletins became important public service information. Shetland's also featured in the popular television crime drama series of the same name, along with wildlife films, most recently with the amazing footage of orcas in the Wild Owls series, narrated by Sir David Attenborough. So proof that you can film and produce successful programmes in island settings and be well supported locally, as shown by the Shetland wildlife enthusiasts who helped cr the crew spot orcas for filming. You can imagine then my disappointment at finding that the BBC iPlayer trailer for that series had completely missed Shetland off its graphic promoting the programme. Presiding officer, BBC Scotland has adapted across the century and I wish it and all its staff well for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Bishop. I now call Sharon Dowie to be followed by Faisal Chowdhury. Around four minutes, please, Ms Dowie. Thank you, presiding officer, and thank you to Jenny Minto for bringing the debate to the chamber. Today we mark a significant milestone in the history of broadcasting in Scotland, the centenary of the BBC's presence in our country. The BBC has been an integral part of Scottish life for the past century, providing news, entertainment and educational programming to millions of people across the country. The BBC has grown from its humble beginnings as a radio station in Glasgow in 1923 to a multi-platform media organisation with a strong presence in Scotland with 14 bases, including Dumfries and Selkirk in my South Scotland region. Over the past century, the BBC has played an important role in shaping Scotland's cultural identity and in promoting Scottish culture and creativity on a global scale. Public broadcasting has always been an important part of Scottish life, providing objective news on current affairs as well as a platform for diverse voices to be heard. It has been at the forefront of this effort, providing a platform for Gaelic and Scots and working to ensure that Scottish culture and identity are represented on the national and international stage. The BBC's contribution to the Scottish creative sector cannot be overstated. From comedy shows like Still Game and Two Doors Down to dramas like Shetland and River City, the BBC has provided a platform for Scottish talent to flourish over the years. The presence of the BBC in Scotland has also helped in the development of a thriving independent production sector, which is the, one of the key drivers of the Scottish economy. As we celebrate the BBC's centenary, we must also acknowledge the challenges that lie ahead. The media landscape is rapidly changing and the BBC must adapt to maintain high quality programming that reflects the needs and interests of the Scottish people. The challenges of technological changes, political pressures and the demands of the digital age make it increasingly difficult for a public broadcaster to maintain its unique position. But the BBC has proven its adaptability and resilience over the past century. And this success would not be possible without the people in the industry. So I'll take time to thank the dedicated professionals who have worked tirelessly to ensure that the BBC remains an important part of Scottish life and culture, from the journalists who report the news, to the writers, producers, cameramen, costume designers, cinematographers, Sound, de sound designers, composers, editors, makeup artists, and many more, including accountants, who create our favourite programmes. They have all made an invaluable contribution to the success of the BBC in Scotland. Presiding officer, let me conclude by saying that the BBC's centenary in Scotland is a significant milestone and one that we should be proud to celebrate. The BBC has played an important role in Scottish life for the past century 
and I am confident that it will continue to do so for many years to come. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Dowie. And I now call uh, Faisal Chowdhury to be followed by Jeremy Balfour. Around four minutes, please, Mr Chowdhury. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, I would like to thank and congratulate uh, Jenny Mintu for bringing 100th year celebration of BBC to the Scottish Parliament. Uh, in November last year, I was one of the co-sponsors of the event in Parliament marking the 19th anniversary of the BBC World Service alongside Jenny Mintu. Uh, I'm happy to speak once again about this issue, this time in a much more local sense. At the event, I spoke about the BBC as one of the most trusted broadcasters across the world. I hope the same can continue to be reflected in the future for the BBC in Scotland. The BBC is a national asset. While it is not infallible, it is invaded around the world for the quality of its product and the reliability of its journalism. Scotland is privileged to have such a long-standing and professional service. The BBC service is a valuable role as a public broadcasting service in Scotland. One of the standout features of the BBC in Scotland is its impartiality. The ability for members of the public to tune in to BBC Scotland programming without political influences or coherence should remain one of the standout features of the BBC in Scotland. That's why I was happy to hear uh, of the BBC's reinstation of Gary Lindikers last week. Much of the day certainly was not at its best without its valid presenters. However, I'm still concerned about the BBC's decision to not uh, broadcast a related uh, programme to David Edinburgh's new series, Wild Eye. I would hope that in future, the BBC in Scotland continues to be a trusted voice that remains truly impartial and above political or economic pressure. On a more positive note, the BBC in Scotland has done a great deal to showcase and promote Scotland's vibrant culture sector. I echo the words of the motion today in the BBC's ability to truly express the depth of Scotland's culture across a range of educational and entertainment programmes. It has and continues to contribute a vital role to the creativity of this nation. In the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, Scotland's cultural sector has seen closure of well-respected and beloved cultural institutions, most recently the Film House here in Edinburgh. Scotland's cultural sector has suffered greatly as a result. The BBC in Scotland showcases a wide range of Scotland's uh, culture, including in Gaelic language programming, Scottish film and television series, and local news reporting. This invariably supports the sector and the vital work does. Continue, continued support from the BBC in promoting Scotland's vast areas of culture helps to revive this sector and uh, sector after a difficult few years. It is now more important than ever that Scotland's cultural sector is continued to be showcased across this valuable broadcasting service, and I hope for the continued success of this nation's institutions. Thank you very much. Thanks again to Jenny Minter. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Chowdhury. And I now call Jeremy Balfour, who will be the last speaker before I ask the Cabinet Secretary to respond. Mr Balfour is joining us remotely. Around four minutes, please, Mr Balfour. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I add my congratulations to Jenny Minto uh, for bringing forward this debate uh, this evening. Can I give you, Deputy Presiding Officer, my chamber my apologies. Um, I had to return home due to a family issue and having to do this online. Um, like others have said, um, I was brought up with the BBC in my childhood. And it has interested me that uh, with due respect to my colleagues who have already spoken, it is definitely a certain generation that perhaps reflects on this more than a younger one. Um, as Jackson Carlo said, the younger generation have moved on 
and the BBC has to recognise that. But as I said, I was brought up with Trumpton, Saturday Swap Shop, Blue Peter, and many more programmes. We now turn on and watch sport live on television every day. But again, I remember the excitement of the Scottish Cup or the FA Cup coming live on television. The Six Nations, the Six Nations and cricket all presented to us and brought to us by the BBC. And today it still has a role in regard to all these areas. As someone whose uh, children are still fairly young, um, I remember watching educational programmes like um, Mr Tumble or Num Tums, which were there to bring fun and enjoyment, but also with an educational role as well. Um, we had a school group in the Parliament this morning, and they told me that uh, the definition of being famous is that you've appeared on Newsline. And yet, that is still a really important role for the BBC to play. But I want to conclude my remarks by looking at the present and at the future. As Stephen Kerr and others have already said, we live in a changing dynamic of news and television. We need to see that reflected within what the BBC does and produces. We need to see more diversity within the programmes that we make. As someone who is seeking to promote disability in, in many areas of life, I'm really pleased that Abby Cook will be taken over as a new Blue Peter presenter, someone who is immensely talented, who has shown that you can do sport and television, even with a disability. I understand that the BBC is looking at making sure that those within minorities are better represented, not only behind the camera, but in front of the camera as well. And these are all important steps to make the BBC more fit for the 21st century. But the BBC and those of us who look back um, with nostalgia to it have to recognise that things are moving and changing. And again, like other speakers, I do hope that we can have a, a grown up debate, a, a debate that looks at all the arguments about where the BBC is, but more importantly, where the BBC should be ending up. And I look forward to that happening, not only within this parliament, but within civic society as well. Let me conclude, Deputy President um, Officer, by wishing the BBC both within Scotland and the rest of the United Kingdom a very happy birthday and wishing it future success in whatever form that comes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Balfour. And I now call on Cabinet Secretary Angus Robertson to respond to the debate. Around seven minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. I'm delighted to close this debate and to join members in celebrating 100 years of the BBC in Scotland. And I'd like to thank Jenny Minto for lodging this motion and pay tribute to all of the contributions from all parts of the Chamber uh, uh, this afternoon. Uh, as colleagues have made mention, the BBC is central to our broadcasting and to our cultural landscape. Uh, it is right that we recognise its significance to Scotland's uh, audiences and communities. And as a former BBC journalist myself, I know the first hand uh, the tremendous value that the BBC brings in delivering trustworthy news to people uh, locally and globally. It's a source of considerable personal and professional pride that I reported for the BBC as its Vienna correspondent for a decade, getting my break, as it happens, via BBC Radio Scotland, uh, who had me on regularly in GMS, reporting on and from the former Yugoslavia during the tragic war there in the early 1990s. Of course. Stephen Kerr. <coughs> I don't want to be divisive or partisan about this, but would you agree with me that James Dornan's comments about the quality of the news output of BBC, BBC Scotland and BBC generally, are not accurate. Captain Secretary. Uh, I, I think all public service broadcasters should uh, be able to stand up uh, to criticism. We all have different perspectives on it. I'm sure he will sometimes watch news broadcasts and, and be less happy about it. And, and perhaps sometimes James Dornan watches certain news programmes is, and isn't happy about things too. I, I, don't want to, I don't want to spoil the consensus that there is across the chamber. No doubt we will have further opportunities to debate in that vein. I think today, on an, uh, which will be watched by a lot of people in BBC uh, Scotland, incidentally, uh, that it's important
important to, re to remain and protect the common ground that we've all outlined uh, today. So that's where I'm, I'm going to uh, remain. And uh, just to put on the record as the Cabinet Secretary for Culture, I have, a, I have a strong interest in how the BBC delivers for our diverse communities and how it contributes to our creative uh, economy. In the last hundred years, the BBC in Scotland has grown from humble beginnings. Its first airings uh, were in 1923 from an attic in Glasgow. Uh, and a lot has changed since. Um, the BBC in Scotland becoming a powerhouse, sitting at the heart of our cultural life, supporting education, innovation and skills development, as well as providing impartial news and information. Through ten decades of programming in Scotland, the BBC's range of content has grown enormously. Audiences can now be informed, educated, entertained by the BBC Scotland channel, by Radio Scotland, by Radio Nungale, by BBC Alapa, as well as the uh, UK Widen and global offerings on TV, radio and through digital platforms. Briefly, yes. Emma Harper. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for giving way. You mentioned Radio Scotland, and in 2003, I know it was only two decades ago, but uh, the BBC Radio Scotland approved 100 Scots words that the um, that presenters could feel comfortable using words like puckle, dreich and crabbit. And I'm just and Rob Gibson, MSP, was part of that. So I'm just wondering if the Cabinet Secretary thinks that it's maybe worth looking at a wee refresh of the Scots words that are used by presenters to see maybe if we're still using the Scots words. Would, I would definitely resist the, the temptation to say anything that would uh, suggest that uh, the Scottish Government's Cabinet Secretary is telling the BBC uh, in Scotland which words it should use. But my colleague has, has made her case well about the role of the Scots language, because a number of us have, have, have talked about the value of the Gaelic language, and I think it's good that we also reflect on the importance of the Scots language as a part, a living part of our, our national life. Now, um, as I've just mentioned, a, a number of colleagues have talked about the the important role in support and, and promotion of the Gaelic language across its television and radio service. And um, that, that first that took place, for what it's worth, in uh, 1923 uh, from Aberdeen. Uh, NG Alapa, in partnership with BBC Alapa, is helping to sustain our Gaelic speaking communities while contributing to economic growth in the Highlands and Islands and to create innovation by delivering content that resonates with audiences. And across English as well as Gaelic, there's more new and original content being made and Scottish-based talent being developed by the BBC, including through its partnership working with our dedicated screen agency, Screen Scotland. Recent programmes such as the tremendous Glasgow-based uh, production Mayflies and the brilliant comedy drama Guilt are just a taste of the new BBC uh, content that builds on the success of household favourites such as River City and Shetland, which have entertained us for decades and provided employment and skills development for our screen workforce. As has been said by members in the course of the debate, the BBC in Scotland provides skilled employment across radio and television. They directly employ around 1,200 people here and support many more jobs and opportunities within the wider creative sector. There are roles across the country from Aberdeen to Kirkwall, Glasgow to Stornoway, Skye to Edinburgh. And we want to see the BBC build on its successes over the last century and grow its investment in our creative workforce. And through its work with partners including Screen Scotland, the National Film and Television School, the Royal Conservatoire, MG Alapa and others, the BBC in Scotland supports apprenticeships, learning, skills and talent development across multiple disciplines. Over 100 years of BBC service in Scotland, we've seen an incredible contribution to our broadcasting landscape, but we cannot take this for granted. We must recognise that a century on, the media environment has changed significantly. Our broadcasters face new and evolving challenges and opportunities at a time when the principles behind public service broadcasting and the purposes of the BBC matter arguably more than ever. Globally, the increasing variety of commercial content offers great opportunities for audiences and for economic growth, but it is clear from our discussion today that the future must continue to have our public service broadcasters at its heart. No other part of our rich media landscape plays quite the same unique role in representing our diverse communities and reflecting audiences back to themselves through trustworthy news and distinctive education. So in celebration of 100 years of the BBC in Scotland, we must recognise the challenges and continue to support our broadcasters as they go from strength to strength. This is particularly crucial given the global dangers posed by misinformation and disinformation.
Very, forgive me, I'm looking at the clock, presiding officer. I'm going to have to conclude now, given, given I am, I'm getting to the end of my uh, time. The sustainability of diverse, reliable news content from authoritative sources such as the BBC is more vital than ever. And in that context, we should all be alarmed by any threat to the stability of the BBC's future or to the sustainability of its funding. While I'm relieved to see that last week's UK government budget allocated a one-off grant of £20 million over two years to support the World Service, it's this government's strong view that the BBC should be properly funded to ensure the long-term delivery of essential public services and continued investment in authentic content for Scottish audiences. We'll continue to press for improvements to ensure more investment in and repre representation for Scotland. In conclusion, returning to the motion, I reiterate my strong support for the BBC in Scotland and recognise the important and the incredible role it has played in the creative economy, our cultural life and our nation over the last century. I'd like to thank members for their contributions and assure the Chamber that the Scottish Government will continue to defend the principles of the BBC's public purposes and work to ensure the sustainability of this cherished public asset for years to come. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes the debate, and I close this meeting.